We trust that the next session will be a continuation of what the Lord has been speaking to our hearts. And specifically, we want to look at the topic of how to get, keep, and impart the anointing. The topic of how to get and keep and impart the anointing. Now we know that the power of the Holy Spirit was given to the church on the day of Pentecost. The wind of God came blowing in and then fire fell upon them, tongues of fire that anointed them to be fearless, powerful witnesses for the Lord Jesus Christ. But that same power that was entrusted to the church at its birthing, at its dedication, at the day of Pentecost, is the same power that we need to transmit to every succeeding generation. And now, as we near the return of our Lord Jesus Christ, God wants to let the fullness, the culmination of the works of his spirit be manifested in the midst of his triumphant church that will triumph over the gates of hell in these last days so that we will be that victorious church that by the power of the Holy Spirit passed down through the generations, passed down by the work of God, that we shall be those that will help complete that great work of God. Now when we think about gaining the anointing, we know it first came when Jesus told his disciples in Luke 24, 49, tarry in Jerusalem or wait in Jerusalem, stay in Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. And so from the time that Jesus ascended to heaven, it says it was after 40 days, then 10 days later on the day of Pentecost, it was the perfect timing of God as Pentecost was the first harvest in, for the Jews, the wheat harvest, it was the time when the church was going to have its first harvest. And so we know that on the day of Pentecost, 120 brethren were in one accord. They had waited on the Lord for those 10 days, 10 being the number of trial in the Bible, of testing. And those that persevered and tarried in Jerusalem through those days, were there on the day of Pentecost to receive the first anointing of the power of God. Now we read in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 6 that there were over 500 brethren that saw the resurrected Christ. Over 500 knew he was risen from the dead. They had undoubtedly spread the news of his uh, charging the disciples, wait in Jerusalem until you receive power from on high. But out of those 500, only 120 persevered. Only 120 prayed through for those 10 days. It was maybe, for some, maybe some were farmers and they said, I gotta go to my wheat field. I can't stay here for whatever reason, good or not. They were all excuses when the Lord said, wait in Jerusalem until you receive power from on high. Many are called, few are chosen. Maybe we could say many are called and few prepare themselves to be chosen. In the Welsh revival that was referred to in the last session, there were 100, over 100,000 people that were saved within six months when this great revival swept the nation and transformed the entire nation. So many wonderful stories of God's power at work there. And yet, all of the churches at about six o'clock at night, people just went to every church it wasn't led by pastors. There often wasn't even uh, a, a planned leader or revivalist at the churches, but all the churches in the nation, people crowded into about six o'clock at night, and they just started to sing songs and, and pray and be led by the Spirit, and one would have a song, and one would have a prayer, and one would read a scripture, one would testify. But 
one that was a central part of that revival, said this statement. He said, all of the people gathered together at the churches at about six o'clock at night. And the services went on. The people kept meeting God all through the even, early evening. And by about 12 o'clock midnight, this man said, the flesh went home. And every night at about three in the morning, the glory, the glory fell. Now that challenges me. Would I be saying, oh, we had a real blessing by nine, it's time to go to bed? Would I be one that would go to 12, but it was still the flesh, the natural, uh, not so spiritual that said, well, this was really great. Would we, would I be among those that waited and tarried on the Lord? until three in the morning when he said night after night or morning after morning the glory of God fell upon the churches wait on the Lord until you receive power and we know in Isaiah 40 verse 31 the scripture those that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength they shall mount up with wings like eagles and an eagle flies different than smaller birds we all are thankful that God didn't say you'll rise up with chicken wings because, you know, chickens can't fly very well. And it, it, if a dog comes along to want to snack on them, it's a lot of effort for a chicken to fly up a meter or two and up, perch up in a tree and get rescued from the dog. Exhausted because they had to work so hard and flap their wings. But an eagle doesn't flap its wings once it's launched into the air. An eagle does not fly by his own strength. An eagle learns to discern the blowing of the wind. As our Lord Jesus said about the Holy Spirit, the wind blows where it will. And if we can be like eagles that discern, not how the earthly wind, but the, how the heavenly wind is blowing, and like an eagle, learn to turn into the wind. We will be lifted higher and higher, not by our might, not by our power, but by the lifting up of the Spirit of God. So we need to learn how to wait on the Lord as we worship here in these days. There are times that we just get quiet before the Lord, and then we feel there's a fresh wind coming, and there's a fresh uplifting of our hearts, of our voices, and we're, we're heading into the wind. We're going higher again so that we can mount up with wings like eagles, not by our own strength and effort, but by waiting on the Lord and sensing his presence, hungering after his presence, inviting his presence, facing into the wind. We are lifted higher and higher and higher now, after the wind of God came on the day of Pentecost, we knew the fire fell. And that fire fell on the 120 disciples to consecrate and empower the early church. Peter stood up in the midst of it, and at the end of his message, he preached with that fire and said, Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus who you crucified. He is both Lord and Christ. And at the end of his message, it says, they were cut to the heart and said, brothers, what do we do? And Peter told them, repent. Turn to Christ. Be water baptized. Join the church. They were cut to the heart by the fire of God that was burning in Peter's heart and Peter's words and, and that was all around them as the Lord had come to dedicate his new dwelling place. For we know that we are the temple of God. Don't you know you are the temple of God? <laughs> as the Holy Spirit dwells in us. And so God came to dedicate the new temple with fire on the altar of the disciples' hearts. Now, centuries before, when God's dwelling place was Solomon's temple, on the day that Solomon's temple was dedicated to God, fire fell from heaven upon the altar and upon the sacrifice of the altar. 
And centuries before that, when Moses' tabernacle was the dwelling place, on the day of dedication, when they offered a sacrifice on the altar, fire came down from heaven. Every time there was the dedication of a new dwelling place of God, there was fire that came down from heaven to consecrate and empower the beginning of this new work of God. And we want to recognize that fire wants to come down and dwell among us. Fire came upon the early church. But the fire that first came from heaven to consecrate the Spirit of God dwelling among His people. That fire came from heaven, but then it, was, it became the responsibility of the servants of God to keep that fire burning. It came from heaven, and it had to be kept burning by the servants of God here on earth. And so, Leviticus 6, verse 12 and 13, tells us the commandment of God for the first dwelling place of Moses. The fire on the altar must be kept burning. It must not go out. Every morning, the priest is to add firewood and arrange the burnt offering on the fire. The fire must be kept burning on the altar continuously. It must not go out. Fire that came from heaven had to be maintained by the servants of God upon the earth. And we know that the fire that needs to always be burning for us is not a fire on an earthly tabernacle or temple like in the olden days of the Jews. The fire that needs to be kept with us is the burning of the Holy Spirit within our hearts. As Paul told Timothy, as we heard before, that he told him, for this reason, I remind you, to fan to flame the gift of God which is in you. Fan to flame, stir it up, get it burning bright, get that anointing functioning, get that gifting powerful and use it. And that word from the Greek, fan into flame, the gift, the gift in the Greek is the charisma of God which was given to you. So there was a charismatic gift, a gift of the Spirit planted in Timothy's heart. There was something of the presence, the anointing, of the supernatural working of God put within him. But then he had to stir it up and use it before it would be effective. And oh, so how often we pray that God will give us a gifting or, or will move. And, and God at times will give us gifts. And we can say, oh, praise God. I can, I can prophesy. But then the next question is, how often do we prophesy? Oh, I prophesied five years ago. It was glorious. Hey, no. Fan the flames bright today. As some of our sisters were stirring it up after hearing that exhortation that Paul gave Timothy. Let it burn brightly that it will edify and build up and stir the people of God. The flame needs to be kept burning bright, hot and powerful. A brightly burning flame is powerful. It can burn down a city or it can empower a large ship that's burning diesel fuel. And the greatest ships can cross the oceans by the power of the fire that's always burning and motivating that large ship, pushing it forward. Well, we need, as the people of God, to keep the Pentecostal fires burning. The fire on the altar must never go out. It must be kept. It must be maintained. Add the wood. Add the sacrifices. Morning by morning, evening by evening, keep the flames burning bright. Is the commandment of God. Yes, for the Old Testament, tabernacle and temple. Oh, but spiritually it still applies to us. We need to keep Pentecost. Not as a past experience, but we need beyond Pentecost to keep it. Get it, keep it, and impart it is the message this session. 
And so, the fire on the altar, we have to be careful, never dies down. Now there's the testimony of William Booth, a great man of God who lived a little more than uh, a century, 150 years ago he began his ministry. And he started the Salvation Army in London, England. He started after a vision where God showed him that he had been a lukewarm Christian that had accomplished nothing in his life, but God was giving him a second chance. And, and after this vision, he knew, oh, I've got to do something with my life. I've got to make my life count for eternity and not be a Demas that just loves this present age and just lives for today, for tomorrow, for the next day, for retirement, for our tombstone. No, we want to live with a vision burning bright of what God wants to do through our life and into the ages to come. For we, by the salvation of Jesus, have been given eternal life and an eternal calling. And as we suffer with him now, we will reign with him in the ages to come. As we carry our cross now, there will be crowds waiting those that love is appearing, that are ready for the coming of the Lord. Amen. And so God wants to prepare us. And William Booth was transformed by that vision. And he started preaching out on the streets. They didn't let him in the, in the churches. He was too hot to handle he, he wasn't a comfortable speaker. He preached repentance. And so he did it out on the streets. And the drunkards started to get saved. The prostitutes started to get saved. The move of God began in London. Hundreds, thousands got saved. And so many got saved, they said, what do we do? The churches don't want us. But we're poor. We don't have good clothes. We can't rent a pew. They don't want us, but, but we're saved. Uh, by, by salvation, we're, we're, we're the people of God, we're, we're a salvation army. And so they appointed William Booth as General Booth, commander of the army. And their motto was, blood and fire. The blood of Jesus Christ and the fire of the Holy Spirit. And William Booth and his army preached and started revivals across the nations. Their motto, blood and fire, they carried wherever they went. Sometimes they wrote it on their tombstones after they died as martyrs preaching in dangerous places. But they carried on. They went on. William Booth survived many assassination attempts and carried revival wherever he went. And one thing that he said was, I'm not waiting for a move of God. I am a move of God. Amen. Oh, can we say that? Can we say that? If a person walks up to me and says, I am a move of God, you know, I wonder whether they need to be put within the walls in Mandaluyan, you know, in the psychiatric wards. But it was real in his life. He had something in God. He had a calling. He had an anointing. He had a fire that he carried with him. Yeah. And he could say, I am a move of God. Amen. By the power of God that he kept burning bright within his life. He was in his mid-80s when he finally lost the last of his strength. And on his deathbed, he gathered his leaders. And his last words to them were, Look well to the fire in your souls. For the tendency of fire is to go out. Have you ever started a campfire? And it's nice and warms up. We toast our marshmallows sometimes out in the other property. But if you don't keep putting wood on it, that fire is going to go out. The tendency of fire is to consume and go out unless there's always something fresh to burn. And so William Booth warned the Salvation Army, keep the fire burning. And that fire has gone through the nations of the world. There's even a Salvation Army church here in Antipolo. There's an orphanage. If you drive out towards Laguna, there's a Salvation Army orphanage. I don't know what all they have here, but I know that the fire of God spread far 
from that revival a hundred plus years ago. Now, John Wesley was another great man of God who started the Methodist movement and by the end of his life had 76,000 converts from his ministry. I wouldn't mind that, would you? 76,000 from the ministry he started. And he preached an average of three times a day, 365 days a year, for over 30 years. Once his disciples said, John, you're getting elderly now. Why don't you just try preaching once a day? Take a vacation. Only, you know, in seven days, just preach once a day. And he did, and after he said, I'm never going to do that again. No, no, no. God called me to spread the fire. And he was asked once, what was the secret of his success for the thousands that came to hear him preach? He said, I set myself on fire and the people come to see me burn. Wow, that was the secret of his success. He didn't pour gasoline on him. He poured the oil of the Holy Spirit. He got the spark of the fire of God burning bright. And it was as burning bright in his life and in his ministry. People would come and people would get saved. Now, John Wesley knew that the great movement he started would continue long after he died. He started something with momentum, with fire, with power. There are now over 100 million Methodists in the world. But John Wesley also knew they could lose their revival fire. He said, my fear is not that our great movement, known as the Methodists, will eventually cease to exist. My fear is that our people will be content to live without the fire without the power, the excitement, the supernatural element that makes us great. They had the power of God. They had people falling on the ground with demons coming out of them. They had people healed, people knocked over by the power of God. They had people come to kill John Wesley and angels stood there to protect him. They had the supernatural. They had the fire of God. Are we content? with services that are just about the same Sunday after Sunday. We don't really expect anything great. We didn't have anything great last week and the week before was kind of boring and you know, we're just carrying on, you know, just wait till Jesus comes. Well, maybe we need to remember William Booth's message. I am not waiting for a move of God. I am a move of God. Amen. God has called us to carry his fire, to carry the message of salvation. He has called us, after you receive power from on high, you will be witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Amen. And we are to help finish that great commission in these last days by the power of the Holy Spirit, still working mightily in the church of Jesus Christ. John Wesley was not concerned that his group would grow small. It's grown huge. His concern was whether they would lose the fire. And unfortunately, many Methodists have lost the fire, but not all. Did any of you ever hear of the revival last year at Asbury University in Kentucky? A revival that started without any preachers or pastors. It was just a youth group, a young people, and, and, and the, the power of God came down upon them. They kept worshiping and testifying and, 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 and the working of God there. They kept going all night the next day, the next day. And the news of this revival spread throughout America until over 50 universities experienced revival because they caught the sparks from that first revival of Asbury University. Asbury was John Wesley's right-hand man that he sent to America to build the work of the Methodists in America. And he traveled by horseback all around America, day after day, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of kilometers, and helped establish a great work of God. And his testimony, the university named after him, they had a revival about how long ago? 
Pastor Edwin, back in 76 or 73, they had a revival there that, that touched not only Asbury and the Methodists there, it touched the nation. And they had another revival there last year that touched the nation. There is still a fire back from the testimony of Asbury and the Methodists that carried the fire of God and brought revival to the nations. Now, how do we keep this fire burning? We need to get it and we need to keep it. Well, it's very simple with a natural altar and fire. You just have to keep adding more wood. Just keep adding more wood, burning more sacrifices. Morning, add more wood, add the sacrifice. Evening, add more wood, add the sacrifices. Just keep it burning, add more wood. And what does the wood represent for us in the New Testament? It represents our natural human works that have no eternal value. The wood, hay, and stubble or straw that will be burned away at the judgment seat of Christ. When we stand before him, will we gain crowns for the gold, silver, and the lasting valuable things that our lives accomplished? Or did we only live for this present world and were the works of our hands, wood, hay, and stubble, that will be burned up at the judgment seat of Christ? 1 Corinthians 3, verse 12 through 15 tells us, if any man builds with gold, silver, and precious stones, or with wood, hay, and straw. Each one's work will be revealed on judgment day because it will be revealed by fire. And the fire will test each person's work of what quality it was. If any man's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he will be saved, yet so as through fire. We don't want to wait until judgment day for the wood, the hay, and the straw in our lives, the useless things that have no value for eternity. We don't want to wait until then to get them burned away because then our time on earth will be over. Our opportunities will be lost to build with something better that will last for eternity. We want, by God's grace, to add wood to the altar, wood to burn as a consecration of our lives that we will continually be offering our lives to the Lord. And let the fire of God burn away everything that is of no lasting value. Most people, or if we live without the fire of God burning in our hearts, we will live natural carnal lives with no eternal reward. But if we daily place our plans, Lord, this is a new day. What do you want me to do? Lord, what should I add to my day? What should I subtract to my day? What should I offer as a sacrifice? How can I serve you today, Lord? They were to offer their sacrifices morning and evening. In morning and evening, we should offer the wood of our human lives to the Lord. Say, Lord, I am placing my day, my plans, my goals, my desires on the altar. And Lord, burn away anything that is of no eternal value. Make my life pure today and powerful and something. Let me do something that will last for eternity. Most people do not live empowered lives daily by the power of the fire of God burning in their hearts. Most people are motivated by substituting other desires, worldly desires. Everybody is motivated by something in life or else you lie in bed the rest of the day, the rest of the week, the rest of the year. Everybody is motivated by something. What fuels our lives? Is it the fire of God burning up the wood? Or have we substituted other fires? The desire for money. The desire for popularity. Ooh, look, look, I've got 355 people watching my Facebook page now. Wow, you know. Uh, what's, uh, is it comfort? Oh, I just want to live a comfortable life. I don't need a lot. Just a comfortable life. And, and is that our goal? 
Or is our goal to endure hardness as good soldiers of Jesus Christ? Amen. Some people live for revenge. <clears throat> I remember what happened to me 25 years ago, and I'm going to get even, and, and there's just a fuel that keeps burning in their lives, but it's the wrong fuel. It's not the love of God. And though we do great things and have not the love of God, we are nothing. We heard earlier in the worship service. But we are to continually put more and more wood on the altar of our hearts to the Lord. Demas left the fire of God's love and instead he went after the love of the world. And we want by God's grace to make sure we stay focused and we're pressing on to the mark of the high call of God. Brother Edwin yesterday talked about how our spirit desires the things of God, but our soul and body can try to control us into carnal or fleshly purposes and desires and directions and bring us into bondage and sin. If we let the power of the Holy Spirit in our hearts control our thoughts, our actions. For the Bible says to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life, is peace. If we will put to death the things of the earth, if we will carry our cross daily and put the wood on the altar and offer ourselves, as Paul said in Romans 12, 1, Therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, Present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. For this is your spiritual act of worship. We don't burn sheep on, in fires, not for a sacrifice, but what is our acceptable worship? We lay our lives down and let the fire of God come and purify us and take away the things of the flesh. As Paul said, I die daily. He put the wood and the sacrifice on the altar every day and went forward throughout his life, not waiting for a move of God, <laughs> but he was a move of God, the Apostle Paul. Too hot to handle for some, but he brought revival to the nations. Tommy Tennis, Tommy Tenney in his book, The God Changers, wrote, Fire does not fall on empty altars. There has to be a sacrifice on the altar for the fire to fall. If you want the fire of God, you must become the fuel of God. Offer our lives on the altar for the fire to burn up. And Tommy Tenney wasn't just preaching theory. Tommy Tenney was a man of God. He might still be alive. I don't know. We went to a revival service of his 20 years ago when my daughter Esther was in eighth grade and she had struggled all of her life up to then with a learning disability. There was just something uh, when she was born or in her earliest years, there was just something in her brain that wasn't connected. And when she was in fifth grade, she still could not spell her name. Esther is not a big, long, de la Venetio, blah, 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 okay, no. It's a simple name. She couldn't spell it. There was a disability. We went to one of Tommy Tennis, Tommy, Thomas Tenney's revival services. She went up to the altar at the end. She stayed there a half an hour, an hour. She stayed and stayed and stayed and was prayed for. And when she came back, she said, something that had not been connected in my brain all my life just got connected. It was hard for her to pass classes. We praised her when she got C's. That was wonderful. After this revival service, she often got straight A's. Graduated from college. Today, she is the assistant missions director for a church of about 3,000 people. She went on in God. She had to meet God. 
she met him at a revival service carried by Tommy Tenney, who knew if you want the fire of God, you have to put something on the altar. You have to die daily. You need to carry your cross and see the work of God go forward in power. The fire of the Holy Spirit needs to be kept burning on the altar. It is not to go out. And if we don't feel the fire of God burning in our hearts, build an altar. Offer a sacrifice. Like Elijah, when the fire of God had gone out, almost all the nation were Baal worshipers. Baal had 400 prophets. Elijah was the only one left on his side. But when he prepared the wood and the altar, fire came from heaven. When we're done with this message, we're going to pray. We're going to pray. If any of you have felt a lack of the fire of God, if you need to stir up and you feel a little of the fire of God, great, keep stirring it up. Let it burn bright. If you have not felt anything, if the love of this world, if the worries of this world have choked out the life of God within you, it's time to get repointed in the right direction. That we're pressing on for the mark of the high call of God. We are pressing on for eternal purposes and for eternal rewards. And so we're going to pray when we're done for the fire to fall. Now as we learn to carry the fire, the last part of our message is we need to learn to impart it to the next generation. Okay, we need to gain the anointing. We need to keep the anointing. And we need to impart the anointing to perhaps your natural children, to your spiritual children, to those you disciple, maybe to your nephews or your nieces, or maybe to your neighbor that looks up to you, maybe to your Bible study, to your church. We need to impart to the next generation the moving of the Holy Spirit. As Paul told Timothy, fan into flame the gift of God. But it also says, fan into flame the gift of God, which was placed in you by the laying on of my hands. Timothy received it from an anointed man of God, imparting that anointing into his life. And so we need fresh fire, sometimes falls from heaven, Sometimes it comes through the laying on of hands in prayer and counsel and prayers of our mentors, of our pastors, of those that lead us on with the Lord. When, Josh, when Moses was praying at the end of his life, who would be the next leader of Israel? In Numbers 27, the Lord said, Take Joshua, a man in whom is the Spirit, and lay your hands on him. Joshua already had an anointing because the Bible says he would tarry in the tabernacle. He would wait upon God and he gained an anointing in his life. But then God said, choose him and publicly install him as the next leader. And Moses laid his hands on him. And you can study in Deuteronomy 34, 9. It says that now Joshua had the spirit of wisdom because Moses laid his hands on him. Joshua already had an anointing in his life, but to step up and lead two or three million people, he needed more than what he already had. And so Moses laid hands on him and imparted the spirit of wisdom to him so that he was able to wisely lead that great people onward. There's a time that my spiritual father, Brian Bailey, first met Catherine Kuhlman. She was preparing for a service, a miracle service she would hold for thousands of people at a time and great miracles and moves of God. And so she was praying and, and as they were in a room behind the stage, uh, Pastor Bailey was introduced to her and she didn't have time for just chit chat, but she went over to him and touched him on the forehead and said, wisdom. And he said, he fell over, slain by the spirit feeling the anointing of God rolling in him. He was already a Pentecostal pastor, a prophet of God. He had a new anointing, the spirit of wisdom. Just by a touch and one word, 
wisdom. It was transferred to him. When I was going for the first time down to Guatemala to teach at a Bible school of 200, and I was a little nervous. Uh, now, I, was, I knew I was called to minister in Central America. This was my first large opportunity. And so I, I was talking to Pastor Bailey, the, where I was staying with him in New York State at the, the Central Zion before I went to Guatemala. And I said, Pastor Bailey, please be praying for me. And he said, yes, I'll be praying for you. The first day I taught, and intellectually, it was, it was good. Spiritually, it was dry. Okay, and I was calling on God, Lord, I, I, I've, I've got a good message, but I need the anointing. And in the middle of the night, I had a dream where Pastor Bailey came up to me, laid hands on me, and as he laid hands on me, I was filled with the power of the Holy Spirit flowing through me. I woke up speaking in tongues, feeling the power of God. And that day when I taught, <laughs> it was fun, okay? There was that, ooh, those waves of the anointing that were there. And they stayed for those weeks that I preached. And at the end of the school year, they made a poll of all of the 200 students. Uh, who was your favorite teacher this year? And I, by a large margin, well, I, I gained, I got the vote. I was the best preacher, the best teacher. And I know that it wasn't because I just had good notes. I know it's because I carried Pastor Bailey's anointing. That's what the people rejoiced in. Can that happen? Can in a dream someone come up and lay hands on you and impart the anointing? To one of their disciples all I can tell you is it happened to me and it's real and then about two years ago I heard the testimony from Pastor Dong that there was a time when he went to Palawan to minister and he was in Palawan and one night he was sleeping and in a dream I came up to him I laid hands on him and the Spirit of God fell on him and he had a new anointing can that be well, <laughs> as long as it works, okay? <laughs> as long as it works, okay? Theologically, I can't tell you all the answers, but experientially, I can tell you that the Spirit of God can be imparted from one generation to the next. Amen. And we need, by God's grace, however it happens, laying on of hands, prophecy, prayer, uh, uh, prayer to someone in another nation, another island, we need to multiply and pass on the work of God. It's like a relay race. In a relay race, you've got the baton, you've got to take it on to the next person who can go farther, who can take it to the next. That's what the generations are. You can give the baton to your disciples. They can grow strong in the Lord. They can carry on to the next spiritual generation. They're spiritual sons and daughters, and they can take that anointing and carry it onward. In the 2008 Olympics, the United States uh, track team had three of the world's four best, fastest runners for the 100-meter race. Three of the four. It was a sure win. The United States team was going to win. They had the best. They were the fastest. So easy. But one of them, passing the baton on, dropped it. And when they dropped the baton, the team was disqualified. We've got to have the anointing and we've got to pass it on because we can drop the ball. We can drop the baton. We can drop the anointing. Elijah had many that followed him and there were three levels of those that received from his impartation. He first had a servant on the day of revival when he was alone up in, uh, up in uh, the territory of Sidonians uh, with the widow woman that fed him. He had no disciple. When he came down and had revival, I'm sure he had thousands of people that wanted to carry his suitcase and follow him. He chose one and he had the servant go, look, uh, is there any rain, any clouds? Uh, and 
servant heard him travail after he saw the fire. When he saw the cloud coming, then Elijah said, Quick, go tell the king to go to the, leave quick, go to the capital before the rain comes and the roads are muddy and your chariot won't move. And so on one day, his first servant saw the fire of God come, saw the prayer life of Elijah who prayed and broke the drought after three and a half years and the rain was coming and then he was sent to the king with a message. Ooh, that sounds like a pretty good first day on the job as an assistant pastor. You're sent to the president, you know, you see a revival and, and you learn some important things about prayer. But the next day, when they were back in the capital and the evil queen threatened to kill Elijah, Elijah didn't carry that victory. He ran for his life and left his servant down in the southernmost city of Beersheba as he went out into the wilderness, the desert, and prayed, Lord, take my life. I'm no better than my father's. And the servant was left there, and we never hear about him again. We don't even know his name. He had such an opportunity to stay with Elijah. He was ready to follow Elijah on the day of Elijah's power, but on the day of Elijah's discouragement, he was ready to leave. Now, we all enjoy following a man or a woman of God or a pastor when they're anointed and preaching so well. And, but what happens when they're discouraged? when they're ready to give up the ministry, when they're ready to run. Are we still faithful? Do we still support them? Or do we say, well, pastor, goodbye. You know, I'll give you the left foot of fellowship. You know, I might be the next pastor now. What do we do? The first servant gained no lasting anointing from Elijah. Then there was another group of people, the sons of the prophets that Elijah regularly trained at his different Bible schools. And many of you have studied at the ZMI here or at the extension schools or maybe at other anointed places where you have received from the Lord something of the Spirit of God. And these sons of the prophets that studied under the anointed ministry of Elijah, they became Pentecostal. We read about the group uh, that went down to the Jordan River from Jericho. It says there were 50 sons of the prophets. They said, Elijah is going to be taken away from you today. They had revelation. There were 50 of them, which is the number of Pentecost. So they got something from God. Revelation, Pentecostal power. Some of them went and prophesied to kings and did great works. But then the highest level of anointing was gained by Elijah's most faithful follower, Elijah, that would not stop from following him. Elijah went through difficulties and trials and said, stay here, I'm going on. And Elijah would always say, I'm staying with you. I'm sticking with you to the end. Until when Elijah was going to be taken up to heaven, what do you want from me? Elijah said, I am your most faithful follower. I am your firstborn son in the spirit. I am asking for the double portion that is given to the firstborn. And Elijah got that double portion, twice as much as the other Pentecostals that had trained at the Bible school. And so we need to see that depending upon our faithfulness, depending upon how we receive from men and women of God, we can receive more or sometimes less. And Elijah's mantle was not just for him and not just for Elijah. We read at the beginning of the New Testament that the angel prophesied in Luke 1.17 that a boy would be born, he would be John the Baptist, and he will go before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah. Centuries later, somebody picked up the mantle. Yes, Elijah picked up the mantle when Elijah went up to heaven. But John the Baptist, centuries later, picked up that same mantle. And by the power of God, prepared thousands for the coming of Christ. And so we want, by the grace of God, to receive from the men and women of God from on old. Study about the lives of the great men and women of old and receive from them. 
Now, Hebrews 11.4 tells us about Abel, that through his faith, though he was dead, he still speaks. Abel's testimony is still with us of what he did by faith and how God was pleased and, and how it can be an inspiration to us. He still speaks even though he's dead. The great servants of God that have passed on, they're in heaven. We don't hear them in heaven anymore. But their voices still speak to those who have ears to hear what the Spirit would say to the church. Their testimony remains on. There was Smith, Smith Wigglesworth called the Apostle of Faith. And if we can hear what well, he's still speaking, maybe we can hear him saying, I was a plumber, a common worker. I had no education. I couldn't read when I became a Christian. But I pressed into God and I gained great faith and I worked miracles into the nations. Or maybe, well listen, maybe we can hear what, although he's dead, his faith still speaks. Maybe we'll hear from John Wesley and we'll hear him say, I was a PK, I was a pastor's kid, but my father was not a good pastor. But I pressed in, I pressed beyond, and as a young man, I brought revival through the rest of my life to the nations. Maybe we'll hear the voice of Evan Roberts, who said, ah, who might be whispering to us, I was a coal miner. But as a young man, I learned to pray heaven down. I prayed and prayed until revival came to my nation. And 100,000 were saved in six months. About Brian Bailey, read his books. You can download them for free from our Zion website. Borrow them from our library if you're a student here. Or all the biographies of great men and women of God. You can download and listen to messages. Brian Bailey preached when he was a, 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 a young a, a prophet of God on fire. And when he was an older, mature servant of God, full of grace and love. Catherine Kuhlman, maybe we can hear her say, I had a wrong marriage. I had a bad marriage. I had to leave it to follow Jesus. I paid a price. And God gave me the fire of God for what I placed on my altar. Charles Finney, maybe we'll hear him say, I was not afraid of the gospel, but I prayed and preached until the power of God always fell. They have passed on, but their testimony still speaks. And if we read about them, if you get on the internet and study about the great men of God, read their biographies, uh, download uh, their, their books, uh, and, and if they've got preaching messages, listen to them. Their testimony still wants to impart life. Pastor Bailey said, the greatest inspiration, the role model for his life and ministry was John Wesley. And John Wesley lived 300 years ago. But John Wesley left an anointing behind to carry on. Just like Francis As Asbury left an anointing that stayed in his university in 1970. 1973, revival fell. In 2023, revival fell. Because Francis Asbury carried the fire of God and his testimony still speaks. So tonight, after the evening message, we're going to have some of the senior leadership anoint the rest of you with oil. Not pray a long prayer. Catherine Kuhlman just touched Pastor Bailey and said, wisdom. And he received something new in his life. Pastor Edwin said, in 2006, 2008, we had a seminar with Pastor Bailey up in Baguio called The Anointing. And Pastor Bailey anointed us and just briefly gave a prayer and touched our foreheads with oil. And Pastor Edwin said he gained a new anointing from that very brief prayer and impartation 
that went forth. And we are going to pray. You pray. You be ready that there will be impartations that will flow tonight as we call on the Lord, that there will be something passed on to the next generation. The fire of God is always to be kept burning, the Bible says. It must not go out. So we need to fan the flame. We need, if you've only got hot coals, to get it burning bright. If you don't know if you've got any fire left in your heart, if it's been replaced by worries, by troubles, by fears, by the love of the world, then let's put fresh wood on the fire. Every morning, let's have devotions and put something on the altar. Lord, today, I'm not going to do my normal, unspiritual activities. I'm starting out with more prayer, more reading my Bible, more consecration. Add fire daily. Add wood, excuse me. Add our offering, our sacrifice, and the fire will keep burning. So if you don't have that fire, then, or only have a little right now, if I can ask for the song leader, musicians, we want to sing that song. Holy Spirit, burn, let the fire fall, let there be something new that will be kindled in our hearts, that we will be able, by the grace of God, to know that we are leaving from this seminar different than when we came. We are renewed, we are recharged. We have a new anointing in our lives. And then as you have it, keep it and impart it wherever you go. Thank you and God bless.